Okay, thank you and welcome to my presentation about the chapters committee. The committee which is tasked with dealing with uh, groups that uh, want to form offline activities. So this session is about the face of Wikimedia. It's not about the Wikimedia Chapters Association. If you are interested in that, go to the unconference on Sunday. So, great, it works. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Bence Damokos. I'm a founding member of Wikimedia Hungary and been a member of the Chapters Committee since 2010. So, while I'm going to present on the history, this is all original research. I've only been a member since 2010 and I'm now the chair. My background is in international relations and English. And please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. I will talk a bit about what the committee is, so how it came about, uh, what it does in a typical year, and what the future looks like when we move from a chapter-only model to a model where everyone can participate. And in the end, I will take questions if you have them. So the Chapters Committee is a committee of volunteers that tries to facilitate the creation of, uh, of, of offline groups of Wikimedians that try to do uh, work that's not only online but offline. So if you're not familiar with the names, the chapters are the national Wikimedia organizations supporting their mission and their users. Thematic organizations uh, have just been invented this year. They specialize on a subject or a theme and they can be either focused on one country or could be across countries. My user groups are just simple uh, groups of Wikimedians that get together and uh, either just have s small activities or something even bigger, but they do not want to form a legal organization to become a chapter yet for some reason. So let's move on. Um, so let's have a look at the history. Uh, it was 2004 when the first chapters were set up. It was the German chapter in 2004, just one year after the Wikimedia Foundation itself was set up. Then came the French ones. In 2005, we had the first Wikimania in Frankfurt. And sometime after that, it was decided that uh, uh, Delphine Maynard, who has been coordinating the chapters as a volunteer, could not do it alone. It was beginning to be a bigger task that needed more people. and. Uh, so a decision came about that there should be a committee that deals with chapters. Uh, and so on, Wikime on Wikipedia Day in 2006, so January 15, a number of Wikimedia committees were set up by the Board of Trustees. The Wikimedia Foundation at the time was very small. It didn't really have many employees, just one or two. It was like a mid-sized chapter and the board couldn't deal with all the tasks it, it was having to deal with, so a number of uh, volunteer committees were set up, like the communications committee that is very strongly going even nowadays, and the chapters committee, but also committees that do not exist anymore, like the special events committee or, yeah. So the chapters committee was set up uh, in 2006 by a resolution, but it only contained the name, the chapters committee. So Delphine Maynard, uh, who was the volunteer chapters coordinator, and. Lukasz Karczewski from Wikimedia Poland, uh, who was the president of Wikimedia Poland at the time, they were tasked to bootstrap the committee. And joined by a group of uh, volunteers from all over the world, uh, three, they chose three other members and two advisors to set up the committee. Uh, and uh, they actually did a good job. They drafted uh, their committee's uh, pages on meta to describe what it would do, and uh, it was a quite a wide responsibility. It was dealing with the coordination of chapters, communication between chapters, between the chapters and the foundation, and any issue that might involve chapters like trademark agreements or the chapters agreement itself. And it was, of course, helping groups of Wikimedians form chapters, so it gave them advice, it gave them helps like setting up mailing lists and anything they could help with. Uh, so initially there was a bit of confusion whether the chapters committee would do all the approval of chapters, 
because the board wanted uh, the bylaws of chapters, uh, so the legal documents to be reviewed by a legal committee, but there was no legal committee, and that kind of confused people. But fortunately, they worked out the differences, and the lawyers did help a bit. So the first chapter that was approved was Wikimedia Switzerland, uh, who were quite uh, advanced, who were a group of people in quite advanced stages of chapter creation when the chapters committee itself was set up, so they were actually a bit confused about what's the new situation. So there's this new committee that doesn't know what it has to do, and the board is waiting for the committee, the chapter is waiting for the board, and so on. Anyways, they fortunately resolved the conflicts, and the committee went on to actually define the requirements for new chapters and what the process would look like in 2007, early 2007. And uh, I will briefly describe this process because it hasn't changed since. Uh, okay. So when uh, we first get an email from a group, we will try to give them some basic advice. Like we would get emails from groups all over the world, uh, like one individual telling us, oh, we would like a chapter in Sri Lanka, or we would like one in uh, Ghana. And maybe he's just one guy, maybe he's like 10 guys who got together and decided. So we will try to help them organize, help them uh, get a group, help them get an active community, mailing list, etc. And we will tell them what a chapter is and how those come about, what, ne what they need to do. Uh, once they get more serious, we get to the second step. So once they decide that they do actually want a chapter, we will try to learn as much about them as we can. We will ask them some questions like, uh, do they have a mailing list? Uh, do, uh, how big is their group? And based on the answers, we will uh, see whether they are on ra right on track towards chapter creation, but more importantly, whether we can give them any help. And uh, just uh, we try to get an idea whether who, who they are, because the chapters committee is basically the face of Wikimedia. So we try to learn every group's uh, setup and desires, and hopefully we can offer them good advice. Uh, this is a, the step where we try to judge whether they have a critical mass to go on and create a chapter to meet uh, the criteria and to be able to sustain a chapter. Because it is quite easy to set up a legal organization, but for it to be able to work for years and years and years, you need a sort of initial group of 15, 20 people. So when you have board elections, there are candidates that can stand and so on. So then we get to the third step when they are quite serious. We will review their bylaws and check whether they meet the formal requirements, which is to have a membership organization uh, that involves Wikimedia contributors, mostly of about 15, 20 members. And uh, we, we try to see if they have like the right checks and balances, uh, the right, for example, on finances. And we will try to give them advice that we've learned from other chapters over the years. So basically, we'll give them a list of advice and questions and recommendations. They will probably answer those in a few weeks and maybe make some changes to the bylaws. Once that has been done, uh, they will send us a new version, and we will just check whether it, it meets our expectations. And once everything is, uh, is in order, we get to the last step which is basically to recommend to the Board of Trustees of the Wikimedia Foundation to approve the chapters, the new chapter, uh, which is kind of a formal step, uh, but it is necessary. After this, the Board of Trustees will uh, just uh, approve the chapters, usually. So uh, to get a bit uh, uh, closer to the present, this is just a picture of how many chapters do we have? So you can see that we have about 39 chapters today, or 38. The chapters committee was founded in 2006, so after uh, after the chapters have been in existence, actually. And uh, well, 2008 was a very good year. We had 11 chapters, and 2011 was also quite a good year. We've had nine chapters approved, and 
I would like to talk a bit of about this here. So, uh, so even, yeah. So we've been quite lucky this year to have had nine chapters, but uh, it has become apparent that chapters uh, and the chapters committee is not the best model for a movement that w wants to be open and wants to include everyone. So inside the committee, we we have found that members have become a bit burned out and uh, inactive. They move on to other tasks and uh, in their lives. So we try to revitalize the committee a bit by updating its rules, uh, making sure that we get new members selected every year, like half of the membership will be replaced every year. I would at this point encourage you that if you are interested in this task, just go to Meta on to, our, to the chapters committee page and sign up to be notified of new selections. So we have had five new members, five new active members added to the committee this year to make sure the work is better. And uh, incidentally, I've been selected as the chair of the committee at this time. But regardless of the committee's internal structures, what's more important was that uh, not all approvals have been a success story for Wikimedia. We've had groups that decided that they really don't want to form on the way they decided at the time they applied, or they didn't meet the requirement to be based on one geographic location. Maybe they wanted to be active in more than one country, which didn't fit the chapters model. Or maybe they just didn't have uh, the required number of members, like they didn't have 20 members to set up a well-working organization, but they did have maybe five volunteers who were active and wanted to do, wanted to be engaged in volunteer work offline, wanted to have projects, wanted to have meetups, and we couldn't accommodate them. Um, so uh, the board set up a process to try to solve this, uh, the so-called movement roles process, and they, uh, they came up with uh, three new models of uh, association or affiliation to make sure that the Wikimedia movement can engage everyone. Uh, let's just skip that. Uh, so these these are the chapters that uh, we all know, the thematic organizations that I've mentioned briefly. The these are incorporated nonprofits that uh, that work on a specific subject or theme, <laughs> which could be anything. It could be like one language, or it could be one specific Wikimedia project. Like uh, let's work on. Uh, I would like to support Wikimedia Commons or something like that or anything. Uh, user groups are like open membership groups of Wikipedians. Uh, and Movement Partners is a group I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, these are like-minded organizations that actively support the Wikimedia movement, but they are not approved through the chapters committee. Uh, there was a question of how to manage the approval of these groups, and it was decided that it would be done through an affiliations committee. There was no clear consensus whether this affiliations committee would be the same as the chapters committee, a different committee, uh, a subcommittee, uh, a supra committee, or whatever. So in uh, March in Berlin, we had a meeting with the board of trustees, the members of the movement rules group who were present and the chapters committee to decide this question and agreed that uh, the chapters committee would slowly transform into the affiliations committee with a new charter that clearly sets out uh, the, the scope of the committee. This is uh, to be approved by the Board of Trustees in the coming weeks. Uh, and since then, uh, the history of the new Affiliations Committee has been really just uh, uh, a repeat of the history of the Chapters Committee. So now we are working on deciding uh, on the rules of procedure and the requirements for new groups and uh, starting to get f the first applications for new groups. Or actually, some of them are actually have been existent and working in the Wikimedia movement for years, like the Wikimedia Catalans, but they, because they didn't fit the, uh, fit the puzzle, we just couldn't include them. Hopefully we can do that in the next few months or, or even sooner. Um, 
And then other thing we have been doing in the com committee is now that the movement is more open uh, to new groups, is trying to educate them to reach out to new groups and tell them about what chapters are, what user groups are, and how they can do th things not only online but offline and how it can be beneficial to them. So I personally visited Wikimedians in uh, Croatia and Slovenia. Uh, members of the committee have went to the Iberocop conference uh, and visited Uruguayan Wikimedians. We would like to do a bit more of this to be more helpful to groups. So far we've been an online only committee. We do try to to make better on our role as the face of Wikimedia, to actually go out to groups and tell them what kind of helps the Wikimedia Foundation or the Wikimedia movement can offer. We can really help new groups with either money, advice, uh, access to t-shirts or, or the trademarks, whatever they need, and we will try to get this message across to them. Uh, so just to briefly look at the future as I wrap, wrap up my presentations. Uh, we do expect new groups, new chapters, new user groups or thematic organizations in at least a dozen countries just uh, based on data we have right now. We expect something to happen in Slovenia, Slovakia, Croatia, to just to mention Europe, then Bolivia, to mention South America and Uruguay. Uh, we do have uh, a group starting in Ghana, which I'm hopeful if you watch Jimmy's keynote, you know that Africa is coming online. So it's not only coming online, but it's uh, also coming onto Wikipedia, and they are starting Wikimedia works. Uh, so we can expect to finally fill the blank map of Africa. It's very blank now. I hope that in three years it will not be so. Uh, yes, so basically, that's what, what I wanted to tell about the chapters committee or the affiliations committee as it will be called now. Uh, I really want to to send a message that we are open. So if, if you are just thinking about setting up a chapter, a user group, an association, please find us either at the conference or, um, or on Meta. We have a page on Meta. You can email us on that email address. Please write it down and feel free to email us or just come up after the talk. And now I have about seven minutes for questions, if you have any. If you have questions, just um, raise your hand. I'll bring the mic to you. Uh, hi. Uh, don't you think that with the cha uh, Chapters Association now being set up with a, you know, they're talking about a, a staff of four or more uh, dedicated to developing chapters, uh, it will be logical to transfer the establishing chapters function over to them, if, you know, before very long? Yes, uh, I could see that as an eventual development. Uh, it's a bit less likely with the new groups. It depends how the new groups are integrated. If we have had set up a new committee for the new groups and had the old chapters committee uh, the way it was, I would have expected it to transfer to the association like once it was set up. Now with the three models together in one committee, I, I expect it to remain outside of the chapters association. And it's a bit outside of the foundation. You have to realize that we are 10 volunteers. Uh, we are technically part of the Wikimedia Foundation's board, but actually it's very much an external function, so we try to serve the whole movement. Thank you. And there's a question behind you. Hello. I'm Ganesh Pordil from Nepal. Uh, we uh, have a group. I can say it's a chapter. It, we say it's a chapter. Uh, it was formed two years back, uh, earlier. And we have been uh, working many th 
things like uh, outreach and other things oh, great. Uh, uh, with the same chapters and we discuss there and we have regular meetings at least uh, thrice in a year uh, or, or sometimes uh, twice in a month too. So, uh, but uh, so far we haven't uh, get any affiliation. So uh, how do you suggest to me to go? Because we, we have to get uh, registration in the local entity, local government, uh, as in a non-profit organization. And uh, which should be the earlier, whether I have to uh, uh, register it in the local entity first, or uh, I have to get affiliation from the Wikimedia Foundation, then I have to go for the local entity. Yeah, so usually we, the strong advice we give is to wait until the foundation has approved you, so you have recognition from the Wikimedia movement, because uh, as you have seen in the process, it, inclu it includes a review of your bylaws, and it's very much easier to do before you have registered locally, because then you can change everything. After you've registered, it's very difficult to change anything, so if we would have any suggested changes, it would make your life very difficult. But uh, please come up to me after the talk and we could discuss this. I believe there was one more question down here uh, in the middle. Thank you. I'm wondering in terms of the chapters that you fill in the different groups you're forming around the world, um, whether um, you're trying to interconnect them um, so that there's so that the, there's sort of like a chapter community, so they understand. Uh, so the a chapter here in the U.S. might be interested in something that's going on in Nepal or in your country. Is there any kind of course cross fertilization of topics of content of issues on a regular basis? Is there a regular I don't know, monthly sort of update or communication to try to make the chapters more integrated and tied yeah. into each other? So th this is something uh, the Chapters Association would like to do, but this is something the chapters can already start doing by publishing monthly or bi-monthly bi reports about what they are doing. The Chapters Committee deals with uh, chapters to be, but when one thing we do is ask a group what would they like to do, like, and they would say we would like to do Project X, and we would probably reply, oh, that's great, uh, a group in your neighboring country has done Project Y, which is very similar, maybe you can get some advice, or, you know, we will try to give that kind of advice, but you are right, once a chapter is established, it's a bit of a miss and hit whether there's cross-fertilization or not. I think we have one more question. Time for one more question, if there's any. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm wondering how uh, interested in setting up uh, an accessibility user group at the DC Public Library. And I'm wondering if you could tell me how I could go about doing that. Uh, yes. So the process is a bit in flux, but. The way I believe it will look like is you set up a me me meta page where you will list your goals and who are the members. And uh, you would uh, f select a contact person for the group who would uh, have to be identified to the foundation. And uh, ask us, uh, the chapters committee, at the email address that you see and tell us that you have this group and uh, we would then look at your meta page, ask you a few questions, and basically recommend to the board, either in a monthly digest or an individual basis, to recognize you for a year or maybe two years. And then, you know, we'll look at you in two years. If you are still active, we will just uh, extend the recognition for the next two years or indefinitely. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to ask the chapters committee members who are in the room to stand up so people uh, uh, who, are, who want to talk to us can know who we are. All right, great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Caroline Baker from uh, Wikimedia France. I'm a member of the board and also of four groups. 
concerning glam, photography, and uh, the partnerships with universities and laboratories of research. I'm going to talk about chapters producing knowledge, uh, meaning um, three projects we did last year and a little analysis of what worked and didn't work with this project. So the three histories, uh, the first one is about a project um, asked to us uh, from the Ministry of Culture and Communication. We, asked, we were asked to do a report about French and languages from France. The second one is about cultural transmission. And the third one is about uh, photographers uh, who visit museums. So I will start with the first story. Uh, we received a mail from the Ministry of Culture and Communication last April, and we were asked to write a report uh, about French and languages from France uh, in the Wikimedia movement. S uh, and we had just a month to answer this question. So we are a little bit excited to receive a mail from the ministry, but we are scared to not uh, answer it properly, but challenge accepted. <laughs> so uh, we will we'll try to do uh, to answer uh, accurately. So we try to look for figures. Uh, we look at articles in uh, Wikipedia in French and in languages from France. We also look if there are other projects in these languages. Uh, we look at figures of the editors uh, who write in French. Uh, are they from France, from Belgium, from Switzerland? And the readers who read uh, the French version of Wikipedia, uh, including uh, countries where French is a second language. And we thought that uh, figures were nice, but stories are nice too. So uh, we um, talk about stories uh, about the difficulties to write in French, which is an international language, in Wikipedia. So we have problem with uh, regionalism. In English, you have British English and uh, American English, and two words can be written in different ways. It is also the case in French. Uh, and uh, one of the specific aspect in French is that uh, the French ministry uh, can want to um, normalize the language by law. So we have a law uh, to, um, that specifies how we talk about uh, titles and um, there, um, how to um, speak about titles for when it's concerned women. And so we had a lot of debates on whether to apply this law or not. And one of the funny stories, uh, it was a reform of the orthograph of French during 1990. And this reform uh, was uh, an initiative of France, but it was very lazily applied in France, while it was very heavily applied in Belgium. So you have uh, a text that is seen as perfectly written from a Belgian point of view, while it looks like it's full of mistakes from a French point of view. And how you deal with this? So, written about, uh, we ask the question, but not the answer. And, okay, so we answer this, and how do we knew how to answer these questions? Uh, we knew because we, are, we follow a lot of blogs, and in this blog, you always have nice stats uh, and people who create uh, the tools for stats. And for the stories, we look at the local village pump uh, to know the cordial and always peaceful debate you can have uh, about language. So in one word, uh, it was not our own analysis we write on this uh, report. Uh, it was just some creation and uh, an original synthesis. So uh, the problem with this report is that when you receive this mail, uh, 20 people will say, oh, I've got an idea. I want to share it on this report. But actually, we were just three people to effectively write. And I say free, I just mean that one guy wrote 90% of the report and we are two on the 10% that left. 
and also we were al always fearing uh, I was very really under answering the question is it what the minister had in mind when they asked us this question um, but it was it was really well received and answering this question that led us uh, do and realize that language is an important topic and a topic in which the Wikimedia movement is really interesting and strong. So we decided to create a work group about languages. And we also, it also helped us uh, to create a francophony list. It's a group uh, with chapters uh, uh, in which French is a language, so there is Wikimedia France, of course, but also Wikimedia Switzerland, Wikimedia Canada, and other chapters to come. Um, the external consequences of this report, which was very, very well received, it is an increase of our credibility because we are not only Wikimedia France, you know the Wikipedia guys, but the Wikimedia France, the guys who wrote the awesome report about French and French languages. We made a lot of useful contacts for lobbying because our report uh, moved from office to office in the Ministry of Culture, so everyone uh, within the Ministry of Culture has heard about us. And we had an awesome partnership with the Ministry of Culture. We were asked to do a second report about um, overseas languages from France, and we went in Guyana uh, to talk about uh, the way Wikimedia movement can improve and help the preservation of uh, overseas languages in France. And the funny story is, is we realize French deputies don't know anything about French copyright law because they ask us to put the report under a public domain license and we say it is impossible, we are French, we have the, the paternity part uh, is required and you can't uh, go to, with a public domain license. So it's funny. Um, the second project, uh, it was about transmission from information to cultural heritage. We didn't understand the title and the explanation is even more complicated. It was a call for paper uh, made by a social science university and one of the women uh, who did this call for paper specifically sent us an email to ask us to answer uh, this call of paper. So uh, we thought, okay, what are we going to do with this? Well, when we answer uh, calls of paper, it's awesome. So let's answer and let's talk about what we know best. So we did a global presentation of Wikimedia movement. We talk about free licenses, uh, about collaborative work, about online knowledge. What does it change when you put information online while it is offline? Uh, we talk about our partnerships with GLAM because there are a lot of people from GLAM in the assistance, so it was, hey, be a partner with us. And we talk about imaging information. So you ca as you can see, this is a map of France, and each black dot is a city. Uh, and all we made this map is by geolocating each city in France. And so you can see that uh, with this little thing, just geolocating every city, you can build a map and you see the areas where have, you have a lot of cities and the area where you don't have a lot of cities. I think you can see the mountains too, but I'm not that good in French geography, so I think you're even worse than me. <laughs> it's not very um, important. And so uh, after the presentation, we received a lot of questions from uh, GLAM and from students. We have even a debate about the PDR policy. Uh, the PDR policy is uh, every accurate copy of the um, two-dimensional um, PD artwork is also PD. And some people uh, from archives said, no, we, we want to um, keep us for ourselves and to add a layer of copyright. 
If you followed the awesome presentation from Jean-Frédéric Berthelot, this is bad copy fraud. <laughs> and someone from uh, another glam said, no, this is copy fraud, and we haven't have a course case in French saying this is copy fraud, and you shouldn't do that. So it's not, we are not the bad guys in this situation. Uh, we made new contacts, of course, from the GLAM and the university. And uh, the funny uh, part, the presentation after us was about the legal issues concerning cultural heritage. And the women during this presentation asked us, are you copyright experts? No, we just come on size up. It's the same thing. Uh, the first, so we had two awesome projects, and we we seen an online color of paper from photographer visitors, a tool for thinking museums. It was an online color of paper, and we seen it on the Twitter account of the Museum of Toulouse webmaster. So we thought, hey, we went through two two calls of, of paper, and it was awesomely received. So let's go see this. What we can do. So we look at the keywords of this call of paper, and it's about social abilities, democratization, cultural heritage, photography in museums, copyright, public domain, collaborative space. Hey, it's totally in Wikimedia from scope. It's our area of expertise. So we answer this call of paper. We talk about hacking public domain. We uh, talk about transmissions by visitors, or a visitor can go to a museum, learn a lot of things, and then share it to in Wikimedia Commons and in Wikipedia articles in his own language. And so uh, doing transmission on his own in a language that is not in the expertise of um, the uh, institution. And we talk about artworks in a larger context, because when you have a piece in a museum, it's only um, the only context is what is in the uh, museum collection. But when you put it on Wikimedia Commons, you can see a much, much larger context because you can see a painting in regard to other paintings that are in other sea museums, and so on and so on. It was really awesome. We worked at 20 people on this, and it was refused. Why? And funny story, I watched this, and last month I received a mail from a scholar, and she said, oh, I'm answering a call of paper about a visitor uh, thinking museum, and I want you to know to help me. Yeah, I will help you doing a paper that I was refused. It's awesome. I love this. Um, and she was actually treating exactly what we said. And she was specifically uh, talking about the partnership between Wikimedia France and the Natural History Museum. So I was very sad and angry. And then I asked myself why her paper was accepted while mine was refused. And that's the question I ask. I think it is because we are not scholars, we are a chapter. And uh, when we write, uh, we are pushing our agenda. We want to change the world. It means that when we speak, we are not neutral. And we know, while a um, scholar will have the vocabulary, um, a perfect vocabulary to answer a call of paper, and it will be more nuanced uh, and less biased. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't answer a call of paper. Answering call of paper, it is always useful because it helps us uh, deal with projects we wouldn't have thought of in the first time. It helps us to know, to realize what people uh, expect us to do, and it increases our credibility. But of course, we have to be careful, but because we are not scholars, and answering is always time consuming, and you have to be careful if you are answering, um, when you are answering, are you sharing your point of view or the point of view of a world chapter, and are you and 
is the point of view of a chapter the same point of view of a whole Wikimedia movement? And of course, uh, to answer a call of paper, you need to have uh, uh, your expertise. And sometimes uh, you think you have the expertise while you're, you don't have it. Uh, so thank you for listening to me. Uh, do you have any questions? Okay. <laughs> yes? Hi, uh, my name is Dumisani. I'm from the South African uh, Wikimedia chapter. We have the same, almost uh, similar problem because uh, we've just had a call call for papers for the Natural, National Heritage Council and we're working on answering that. But yes, as you say, my view on that, call, on, on that paper is not necessarily the view of the chapter. So we think along uh, collaborative writing, it's worked on one thing, it's not working on other things, but we hope it will work on this. What is your uh, feel towards creating credibility, especially with government, uh, government and institutions as a chapter? Um, do you think they are responding to you as a chapter? They are taking the information that comes from your chapter as a credible information, or are they looking at um, other venues besides the chapter? Uh, I think we are seen as a credible source uh, when we are asked to do something. But uh, if we answer a call of paper and we are not specifically invited to do, we are seen regarded as a less accurate source than uh, someone uh, with the scholar. And that's why I think the two first call of paper worked and the, uh, the third one didn't. Is it answering your question? Yeah, sorry. Do we have any more questions? Thank you. OK, please, let me take this mic. It's better. Yeah, it works, but I prefer to be able to move during my session. Sorry. <laughs> I hope this is okay. So, welcome to be here. This is the WikiTV session. Um, this is a, quite a new project, so please don't expect me to present a lot of results, but I hope that I can present some of ideas for you to maybe you want to join the project or you want to implement something similar in your country or your community. WikiTV started quite spontaneously uh, due to a cooperation in Austria we had with the Austrian public broadcaster, ORF. And um, they provided us with a software to do video production via internet. The software is called SwitchX and we have been playing around with it and making TV productions together with them for their program about Wikipedia. So basically this was more like an outreach project or PR project. They wanted to have an interview with us, they provided us some software, we made an interview for them, we were happy that we have been on the TV and in the, in the long run we got the software, we are able to use it to make our own TV productions. WikiTV that's how we call it. I'm actually not sure if this is a good name for the project, but anyway, this is what we are doing now. And we actually started doing three things. As this happens with these spontaneous projects that have not been started as a project. So we just, yeah, we did something and after a while we just found out that we are in the middle of a project, even though we never thought of making a project. So at that point I tried to wrap up everything, what we have started, the different um, efforts concerning video and wiki, and all put them under the umbrella of wiki TV. So one part is making videos in high quality via internet. 
That's the switch X part, which we have already tried doing with the ORF, with the Austrian Public Broadcaster. The second thing was that I've been asked to go to conferences like Wikimania in Germany and hey, we will have a lot of interesting talks. Can you please um, capture this on video and stream it or not stream it, just bring it to the internet um, for people, for archiving and so on. And different interesting things happened from there on. And we have also a video platform is called Debato. This is an, a project run by an Austrian. Uh, he, he, he wasn't the Wikipedian back then, but he is now. So we assimilated him. And, um, and he is donating the platform now to us, um, which allows uh, video conferencing just using a Flash plugin. But it is a bit more than just video conferencing. It's something like an online chat, website with a chat, and people can vote who should be a speaker, and the speakers will then be able to contribute to the session via Flash with their own webcam. So you have two rounds. Basically, you have the speakers on video, a panel. Everyone has one minute and then the time slot moves on to the next speaker. And you have a chat with uh, the web page for everyone else who is watching this, making comments and so on, voting and so on. The idea is maybe, uh, unfortunately I'm not able to show it here at the moment, but um, the idea is that we could use it for instance for arbitration things or for instead of voting on a wiki page, we could have a session like we devote one hour and then we set the goal that after one hour we want to have a result. And by limiting time slots to one minute, it might be feasible. Anyway, let me show you a little bit more. This is just stupid text. This is uh, one of the videos we've been making using SwitchX. This guy here is the same guy you see in this little box. Oh, you don't see him right now. Um, Maybe we can ask him to say hello to us. Uh, Julius? Hi, good morning, Washington. That's Austria. My name is Julius Kertke. I'm an uh, editor at the Educational Program Corporation between Austrian Public Television and Bavarian Television. And it's a great uh, pleasure uh, to have started the cooperation. Uh, with Wikimedia, Wikipedia Foundation, it's a very great idea, and we hope uh, that we could uh, force uh, the multimedia aspect uh, in this big uh, field to, to collect uh, all the knowledge of uh, humankind. This idea was fascinating me, and so we started to do TV programs. Thank you, Julius. I hope you can hear us now. <laughs> Thank you, Julius. So this is live now. This is through the Switch X client. This is, unfortunately, it's Windows software, proprietary software. But we got it for free, as in free beer. And um, so we are now connected with the ORF studio in, in uh, Vienna. We can, uh, you see, they have several Switch X clients connected with several uh, cameras. So ca they, they even use it for the local build uh, image uh, mixing and um, so this is one part and this video here on the screen is uh, one of the results. We had a German conference uh, in summer last year and I took just this notebook with me, a webcam and a, and a headset and agreed on a, on a time I think three or four hours in an afternoon together with Julius and I asked several people from the German community, hey come visit us in our room, we make a, a five or ten minutes interview with you. So I set them in front of the computer, they were talking with Julius for a while, after these three hours this afternoon when we had like I think six or seven interviews we did, um, the SwitchX client uploads everything. Yeah, let. Let's get a bit technical here. What, what this is doing is actually, uh, we stream a very low resolution picture, like Skype, over the internet. That's what you see here. And, and audio, of course. 
and then uh, you can control this is push to talk only the person who is visible in the in the image can actually speak so it's only one person at a time who is able to to speak you can hook up as many clients as you want you can have a panel with like 10 people and then switch between them and if the master of this session sets in recording mode, then all clients are recording what they are sending. Only when they are sending, they are actually recording. But they, are do, they record in high quality on the local hard drive. Once the session is over, the client is encoding it and then uploading it to the central server, which runs the conference. So. That's, that's how it works, that you get the high quality video through the internet. It's because we uploaded it later, afterwards. You don't need the high bandwidth during the conference itself. Um, that's what we did in Nuremberg. And we, I put up here these single interviews. And uh, we made a nice uh, video of it, out of it. I, I won't, well, I can play it. I mean. Uh, it's in German, so you won't understand, but you maybe will see how it works, uh, switching back and forth to the clients. Let me, ah, you, I, I think you know this guy. Um, so this was in, in the room. I just want to show you that you can see a little bit how, how the switching works. Yeah, yeah. They, they actually, in, in, in Vienna, they work with five cameras, five computers, they all run the SwitchX client, and so they can switch between the five cameras. So they use SwitchX instead of the regular uh, video setup you would normally have in a TV studio. So this is one part. Uh, the idea is that using these uh, individual videos, you can remix and make a new video out of it. So the, the big video I showed you up there, that's an extract. That's a, a show, I, I think it has eight minutes, and it just has the most important and most exciting questions in there, mixed together from all the other interviews we had. And with this, these are all the interviews in full length. So everyone can download it and make a new show out of it. That's the idea of Wikitv, this share and remix thing. Um, we also recorded some sessions using real video equipment, not webcams like, like this. <laughs> okay. Um, we we used real video equipment first. We we rented some, and after a while, we decided to buy real video cameras, tripods, and I'm very excited to be able to show you this. This uh, wind uh, protection thing. This is a prototype, actually. We will get them. We they are really expensive, and we had to buy at least, I think, one hundred. Ten? Ten. Yeah. <laughs> Up there are the Swedish guys. Please give an applause to them because they arranged that. Yeah, we had to buy ten of them, even though we don't need that many. So Wikimedia. With the money from Wikimedia Germany, we bought, oh, well, we have not yet bought, this is the first one. We are expecting to buy a second one. And we think Wikimedia Sweden has also bought one of these cameras. Um, so this, this makes three of them. So we have another seven if you need some. They are actually very expensive. I think 100 euros or something. Yeah, because this is custom made for us. But they will look a bit nicer. This is just a prototype. So they printed the logos on a special uh, thingy and, and, and put it on here. Uh, the, the real version will then be printed directly on this rubber thing. Yeah, this camera is about 4,000 euros. It, um, we were looking a lot what camera to buy. We want to get professional equipment, but it shouldn't be overly expensive. Uh, what I wanted to have is HD, of course, to be prepared for the future, even though we are currently not yet uploading HD to comments. Uh, one sentence about uploading to comments. Comments is limited to 100 megabyte of upload, which is a problem for Wikitv. You see, most of the videos actually are bigger than 100 megabyte. 
Uh, right now we upload it to an FTP server, upload a text file which has the same file name, just .txt extension, with all the metadata, so which would you normally put in the wiki page there, with the source and contributor and all that stuff, license. And then I have to send an email to a Wikimedia Foundation developer saying, hey, here, here, here I have another bunch of links, would you please transfer these files to comment? And they will then hopefully do it when they have time. Sometimes this happens within an hour, and sometimes it takes four weeks and asking several times. <laughs> um, this is not very good at the moment, but at least the plan in our project is now set up a special server for this, which can also hold a SwitchX server. So we have our own server and don't have to ask the ORF every time we want to make a session. And have a space where we can upload these files. Uh, and maybe eventually there are talks ongoing that we might get a special feature that we upload our stuff via FTP and then we can copy the URL somewhere and press a button and then the stuff will be transferred automatically into, imported automatically into comments. But this is very early talking now. Um, there were just ideas. What we also did was streaming. Uh, when uh, Sue Gardner was in Germany. Um, this was really fun because we, uh, we needed a lot of um, audio equipment because we had live translation. So we streamed the translated, I think we tr streamed the translated and recorded the English, the, the, the original language. And we always had to switch because people were asking questions in German then we needed the original audio on the stream, and then uh, Sue was answering, and the translators were translating into German, and we had to switch to the translated audio. So we have always the German audio in the stream, and uh, so on. Yeah, it was a bit uh, interesting. Uh, I've got some pictures from here, how this looked. You see, this was uh, rented equipment as well, and the, this equipment was really, really crappy, but it cost a lot of money. Uh, that was also one of the reasons why we decided to get our own equipment. Um, yeah, I, this is my, my private uh, thing. Uh, I bought this quite early in the process. Um, it has an USB output, which makes it very useful. You can use it e either just hook it up to the camera via XLR, if you just need the, the analog audio, or you can hook it up to your computer which makes it easy for streaming because the computer will just detect the sound card. And you can use this as a sound input. Um, you see we hooked up, <laughs> over there we hooked up uh, one of these radio tr transmitters so we could uh, insert the translated audio. So it was kind of an interesting setup we did here. You need to be a little bit flexible and I have to say I'm not a professional in this. I mean. I'm just doing this as an amateur, so you always have to try to find crazy solutions to work around some technical pro uh, problems, because you arrive here an hour earlier, and then you have your setup, and you have some other technical things, and then you have, have to make it work somehow. And, but don't let you discourage you by this. Um, I would say the opposite is the case. Uh, if you are flexible and if you like to uh, do things like this, just go on. Uh, I mean, you don't need to be a professional. Just play with it. And I mean, the worst case that can happen is that um, you're trying to record something and, and the, the outcome is not very nice, but just play with it. It's not a problem. I mean... Um, That's the way to learn your thing. Pardon? That's the way to learn your thing. Yeah, exactly. You can only learn by trying. Of course, you can ask us. We may, might be able to give you some hints. We might, might not. <laughs> As I say, we are no, not professionals, but we have some experiences, and we are getting new experiences. This camera is brand new. We just have it one week. We will have to play with it to understand how it works for the next session, but we will do that. And I, we recruited Marco now, very happy, from Austria also. Um, 
This camera was brand new. It arrived in the, uh, the office of Wikimedia Germany just the day before he traveled to Berlin to, um, to make some video recordings at the Wikimedia Academy. This was a very spontaneous thing, but anyway, that's, that's how, how he is learning as well. Um, you see, we have made a lot of videos here, for instance, with the board meeting at the, not the board, board Q&A session during the Wikimedia conference. This is also part of our idea what Wikimedia, what the Wikitv should do, provide more transparency. We have a Wikimedia conference in Berlin where all the chapters representatives are going to. We have a board Q&A sessions about uh, things uh, many chapters and m many other community members uh, think about, uh, discuss about. So if everyone agrees, I mean, this is the requirement, of course, then why not record such sessions and then bring it online so other people can, can see and can see, okay, um, <coughs> I want to know what the board has answered to these questions and what, what has been discussed and, and, and how they are explaining their resolutions and so on. Uh, this brings me to another um, topic. This is uh, here. Um, I have asked the, the chapter selected board seats candidate. By the way, who knows what the chapter selected board seat is? Or who does not know, sorry. Maybe that's, okay, in the Wikimedia Board of Trustees from the Wikimedia Foundation, there are two seats, two persons who are selected by the chapter boards or by the chapters. And we recently had another election or selection. We, we try not to have it as an election, but try to find a consensus on we want to send to the Wikimedia Foundation Board of Trustees. And we had these six candidates here. And um, what I did, I sent an email to them and say, hey, provide me please with a one minute video. Some of them did not have video equipment, but they were participating in the Wikimedia conference. So I shot a video there for them. And we put it up here. And so the community could see, okay, what's their statement? Why do they want to be part of the Wikimedia Board of Trustees? And I take this as an example. Lissy, Lissy because I have done, I have started working on that uh, with translations. Because it would be great to have these statements online with subtitles. So, um, you see here, we have subtitles in Germany, uh, in German and English, and here you can make a new translation. Ah, the, okay, this just leads you to the to the uh, help page about this, but uh, you see this uh, format. We have a special uh, namespace in, on Commons called timed text. Then you have the file name of the video, the full file name, .ogv, including the extension. And then we add a dot language code, like en for English, and srt. This is a special file format also used by other applications on your computer, like VLC, for instance. The video player can also use srt files to display subtitles. Um, there, if you look on this um, help page here, um, you get some hints on how to do that. There is a very nice website. I just forgot the name of it. It's, it's not from the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, Universal Subtitles, right? Um, you can just paste the URL of a video and then you just use the space bar to go through the video and to type and then it, 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 it works in several rounds. First, you just type the text. In the second round, you try to position the text. And in the end, you can download the subtitles. And it makes it very easy to create subtitles and to position them correctly. Uh, one thing is very unfortunate. The video player of comments actually supported subtitles a while ago. So whenever somebody added a subtitle here in this time text, you could, you could just activate it and see it right here on the player. This doesn't work anymore, unfortunately. 
Uh, I've heard that people are working on it and I can only urge you, anyone who has the capability to do so, please talk to the developers or to the relevant persons. This is really a feature which is really, really, really needed for Wikitv because I don't want to have this as a German or whatever project. I would like to see international videos with subtitles. Um, yeah, that's. I think we covered most of it. I have. I, I brought some 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 pictures for you, so you might get a bit an understanding what's going on. Yeah, that's the 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 audio equipment. We bought here just hooked up via USB to my computer, so that runs Linux, so that also works fine on Linux. You don't even need a special driver or something, just a USB sound card generic driver and it works. Cables, very important cables. Cables with different type of connectors, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I already showed you this. Um, yeah, some pictures from the OIF. So they are using this professionally. This is really incredible. Uh, of course, this is not the normal way how they how they uh, produce their shows. This is just uh, one producer using this, and he actually also invented the system and paid someone to implement the software. Um, but it works really nice. You see, that's how it's being controlled. Um, yeah, ah, very nice story. We, we have been at Linux Tag. Um, the, they call themselves the, the European's biggest Linux and open source convention. And it happens every year in Berlin. And Wikimedia has had, had a, a booth there to present Wikimedia, Wikidata, and uh, so our projects. And um, the uh. organizers of Linux Tag are actually also volunteers. And they got an, uh, a request from, from a German TV station, from Computer Club, a very famous uh, computer magazine on TV. They want to make an interview, but they can't come to Berlin if they could make something via Skype or so and ask for uh, what, what kind of technical means they had available in Berlin. And somebody forwarded this email to me. I said, no problem, I just bring my notebook and then we can do it really in TV quality. Nobody wanted to believe me. The, the, the Linux stack people said, ah, uh, they said Skype is enough, so let's do it with Skype. Nothing complicated. It is not complicated. So in the end, we were talking to the TV people, and they say, "Yeah, sure, do it with WikiTV. We 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 never heard about Switch X and WikiTV, but it sounds really exciting. Let's doing it." And so we used our booth here. You see, um, this is the Wikipedia book all about Wikipedia. You see, it's very useful even in the digital world. <laughs> and um, because it's it's not very good if if the if the notebook is down there. And the webcam is like this. So we had to bring it on the same level. So we put this guy here from Linux Tag to say, yeah, welcome to our booth. You know, this is the notebook. Please just use this headset and sit down. And, um, and then Julius from Vienna coordinated the live uh, conference between Berlin and Düsseldorf, where the other TV guys were sitting who actually wanted to make the interview. And yeah, you see here the SwitchX client with Markus talking. And, um, and you, here you see these other two guys from Düsseldorf. And um, an unexpected result of that was that we got the TV show under free license. And they interviewed Julius and me, who were not even involved in Linux Tag at all, about what is WikiTV and put that into the show as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it's time for questions. I have some videos here to show, but no, I think that doesn't make sense. Uh, um, if, if you're really interested in, 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 in seeing this, we can do this uh, one by one. Uh, I would rather invite you to ask questions. 
Uh, this looks like a great project. Do you think you'd um, go the route of Ustream, uh, where it's there's a constant um, channel focused on one thing, like a different, you know, you know the format for Ustream, where you have different people who um, sort of like a social network sort of format. Do you think that uh, the chapters might adopt that model eventually? Um, well, I've actually never worked with Ustream, or have never heard of it before, but. Um, I think um, the, the, the discussion is uh, streaming or, or, or uh, on-demand video. Most of what we are doing is on-demand video. And uh, I think in most cases, this is actually the better way to go. Bef because of several reasons, it's much more, much more stressful to do live streaming if you want to ha maintain your quality. And most of the time, uh, there is not much benefit in actually live streaming. People would be much happier if they had, if they could choose the time whenever they want to review what has happened at the General Assembly or whatever at this discussion. Uh, so whenever we can, we try to avoid streaming and just go for a normal recording, uh, minimal post-processing. This is what, what my uh, experience is. Um, Better have two cameras and a video mixer right on the spot, mix live, and only record that. So the only thing you have to do is cut, start, and end of the video and encode it and upload it. Because the more time you need for post-processing, the higher the probability that you will actually never end up doing it. So um, as a platform, we still use comments at this point, even though comments is not so perfect. but. Yeah, a adding social media would be a nice idea. Um, yeah, just a comment on your question there. I'm Jan Einhalle from Wikimedia Sweden. We're using not Ustream but uh, Bambooster, which is a free service which also has unlimited, no no time limits on on your uploads or your streams. So we're, we're exper experimenting with that. Yeah, and the comment on the 100 megabyte uh, thing with comments. Right now, you can get 500 megabytes if you switch on chunked uploading. Okay, that's very good. Any more questions or comments? Yeah. Don't you plan to make some uh, short movies, for example, about the towns in the Germany, you know, something like for tourists? Because it will be also the way how the Wikipedia can make good advertisement. You mean like uh, touristical videos explain, like Wikilove's monuments and videos, right? would be a very interesting thing. But the point where we are right now is looking for volunteers actually working with us. We have a mailing list, a German mailing list, of course. Uh, in the German Wikipedia, you can find Wikipedia colon Wikitv. There's a link for the German mailing list. But I guess most of you don't speak German. So uh, go to Meta. There is a page called Wikitv. It's still very brief. It just has a link to the comments category right now and a very brief description on what it is about. But I would like to see this as becoming the, the place where people thinking about similar projects get together. And uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, it, from, from my point of view and from what we are doing in Germany right now, starting very slowly and as a very small project at the moment, um, I think it's hard to, to do a lot of international coordination, but if we can spread the idea to other communities that they also start doing something, then maybe next year there will, won't be one Wikitv uh, session with one guy talking only about Germany, but uh, maybe five people telling us about their experiences in their country and maybe new ideas, what they have done and what others have tried, and then we can start uh, benefiting from each other. I really like the idea. I really like the idea. I mean, one of the ideas was to, we have spoken, we have written Wikipedia, of course, obviously. We have spoken Wikipedia, at least in German and Alemannic and some other languages, I guess. I'm not sure about English. I guess it exists. I'm not sure. 
and um, and this is adding videos to it. Why not discuss sign languages? I haven't thought about that. Yeah, but it's a good idea. I I thought like, well, we might have a um, when Libya was was all up in the news. Why not talking to someone who is an expert on that matter uh, using SwitchX? He might be somewhere at the end of the world. But we could talk to this person, have a brief interview, upload it to the to comments and put it on the Libya article and then we have added new content to it, new facts maybe. Or um, we could I could think of that people are actually somewhere in a, in a place, in a situation where something important happens, be it important for the Wikimedia community, like the Wikimedia conference, or being at the, uh, somewhere out in the real world where something happens. And we had a video which we could use also as a, as a source. Like, uh, like we have a fact in an article, and we can say, yeah, and, and we, back, we can back up the fact by this video. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean using it as a, as a reference. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what you are saying is that the video would be the same as a publication. We can reference it as a publication. It's, it's an idea of mine. Maybe the community disagrees. <laughs> so but uh, like we can take a video of ori uh, original research and upload it and it would become a publication? I'm not sure. I, nice. at, least I, at least I want to start that discussion. Why not? Sure. Nice. I, I'm, I'm not sure what you are thinking about it. I like that idea. <laughs> there was supposed to be a talk about that. Yeah. That what has been cancelled. You know the title? Yeah. Video on Wikipedia. Ah, I think that was in a parallel session right now, yeah. right? <laughs> But it wasn't. I went and they, they started. Would have there. liked to see it actually, <laughs> for reasons you might imagine. <laughs> and there is a question over there. Uh, I want one question. I have two questions. Um, one question is: Are you sharing the information about the? hardware that you're using or about other folks experiences with different cameras and microphones uh, yeah well I have all the information what we have done and what we have evaluated is right now on the German wiki TV page but I think we should move that to meta and uh, so allow people to to add more to that yeah we should do that my other is, the other is not a question, but a, a um, comment or a um, I'll offer. Uh, I work here at the DC Public Library in DC, in uh, Washington DC, and we have a um, meetup happening on next Tuesday with Gallaudet University, a, uh, a program between Gallaudet University and the University of Wisconsin where they talk about the accessibility of these, accessibility to people with disabilities of these kind of systems and that program has assessed the accessibility of all of the major like Skype and Google Hangouts and all the different ways to conference and to archive online and they've created solutions so I'm off you know I can be a resource for folks who want to find out about for instance having two videos so that you have sign language translation or how to easily caption videos and the Comparison between the different systems that allow you to caption for free, and um, and the ge you know general accessibility, so that we can make this kind of system as accessible as possible as soon as possible. Thank you very much. That sounds really interesting. Unfortunately, I won't be here on Tuesday, but I think we can exchange our details, contact details, and maybe somebody in the audience is interested in working with you as well. I'm at, uh, my name is Patrick Timony, T-I-M-O-N-Y, and I work at the DC Public Library. So if you 
Google Timoney and DC Public Library, my contact information. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm sort of the part of the other half of that equation. I'm at Olivet University, which is a, a university for deaf students here in DC, and one of the people, the the, the one of our PhDs is one of the guys that's going to be talking next week at the library. Unfortunately, I'll be at OSCON in Oregon, so I won't be there. <laughs> I see. Well, I hope that we can hook up. Please, um, please be bold. Go to that meta page on WikiTV. Sign up your name so we can stay in touch. And I will add some more information. What we are doing, what cameras we are using, why we have chosen these cameras. Um, so to allow you to look into it. And I, well, part of my project, by the end of last year, I started r making this a project after already having done several <laughs> things with all this. But then I started planning this more as a project. And, and one part of my plan for, for the one year was um, also spreading the idea internationally. So that's why I'm here and I try to get you enthusiastic on that topic. Uh, even though I'm not the expert on that, you see, we are just starting and we are just trying things and maybe failing in some points, but uh, yeah. Thanks for coming. Thank